Hey, everybody. Thank you for being here with me. I want to have a conversation today about Afghanistan uh, with a guest who has a lot to tell us. She wrote an article called The Ides of August that's sort of been blowing up on the internet and for good reason. Her name is Sarah Chase, and she is a former reporter for NPR. She covered the fall of the Taliban and ran a soap factory in downtown Kandahar. She served as a special advisor to two commanders of the international forces in Kabul, and then with ch to chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen. She was a senior fellow with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace's Democracy, Conflict, and Governance Program. Before I bring Sarah out, I just want to say that we are all aware that a debacle occurred here. But it's so important that we start learning whatever it is we need to learn so that the United States can stop repeating these disasters. Um, there are a lot of simplistic things that we can say. The generals lied to us. The government lied to us. But there are so many different layers of this. It's like a crime story. It's like the more you read, you start asking yourself, well, who were the good guys and who were the bad guys? When I was growing up, my father used to tell us about the Byzantine rule. Nothing is ever quite the way you think it is. Why is it that America's longest war was actually never declared by Congress in contradiction, of course, to the US Constitution? Why did this war get so little congressional oversight? And it's not enough to just ask what was happening militarily. We need to ask some much deeper questions than that. And of all of the people I've read, the one asking some of those questions and giving some of those answers is our guest today. Sarah Chase. Sarah, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to you for being here. I'm delighted to be with you for this conversation, Marianne. Thank you. you. You talk in your article and in other interviews I've seen about the corruption um, of the Afghan government and what that meant. You know, we heard over and over and over again, this is not a problem that can be solved militarily, but there's so much more uh, to an effort like this than just the military. Uh, I want to read you a little bit from your article. Americans like to think of ourselves as having valiantly tried to bring democracy to Afghanistan. Afghans, so the narrative goes, just weren't ready for it or didn't care enough about democracy to bother defending it. Or we'll repeat the cliche that Afghans have always rejected foreign intervention. We're just the latest in a long line. I was there. Afghans did not reject us. They looked to us as exemplars of democracy and the rule of law. They thought that's what we stood for. And what did we stand for? What flourished on our watch? Cronyism, rampant corruption, a Ponzi scheme disguised as a banking system designed by U.S. finance specialists during the very years that other U.S. finance specialists were incubating the crash of 2008 a government system where billionaires get to write the rules. Is that American democracy? Well, so I want to go back, and then I want to ask you about this corruption that you so eloquently describe. According to you, when we first went into Afghanistan, or correct me if I'm wrong, according to you, when we went into Afghanistan, it was not necessarily seen as an invasion. We got rid of the Taliban. It was understood about al-Qaeda, et cetera. And the Afghani people were open to what might happen. What, in your view, is why we stayed? Why do you think we stayed past the original effort? You've written about how Bush President Bush, he just wanted to wash his hands of Afghanistan. He turned his attention to Iraq, basically left it to the CIA, who, as you mentioned, and we'll certainly get to, had very deep relationships with military intelligence in Pakistan. So from your perspective, after the original job of routing out the Taliban, getting, routing out al-Qaeda was accomplished, why did we stay to begin with? It's hard for me to answer that because at the time I was just on the ground. You know, I was on the ground in Kandahar trying to put together a, a small um, non-governmental organization at the time, you know, like launch a radio station, right? So I was not privy at that time to any of the thinking 
on the part of American decision makers. But I could hazard two, I want to say, informed guesses. One is that don't forget we had not yet routed, I mean, we had routed al-Qaeda, but we had not gotten Osama bin Laden, and we did not know where he was. So that was a, um, I want to say, a motivation for sticking around. And indeed, the U.S. deployment as it you know, started to roll out in Afghanistan was in the east. And in fact, it was in the mountainous hinterland of the east, which is not at all important. I mean, if you're nation building, you want to nation build where, there's, where there are some people, right? But that is not where the U.S. put the bulk of its effort. Um, the Taliban capital had been not Kabul, but rather Kandahar in the south, which was the town where I lived. And there was zero U.S. presence there for a very long time. Indeed, there was almost no U.S. presence in Kabul. And I remember those early months, you know, sort of wondering what's going on here. There's no one home at the embassy. You know, I mean, you had people coming in on two-week rotations. You had people being pulled out of retirement. And we just couldn't figure out what was going on those early months. Like that was the window of opportunity to help build something that could hold um, and that could be responsive to the aspirations of the Afghan people. Um, and we were not doing that. So when I hear we shouldn't have done nation building, I kind of say, well, what nation building did we actually do? The second thing I'd like to say is you can't just topple a government and then walk away. I mean, you know, even in, in when we go to buy something, right? Fragile and breakable, you know the expression, you broke it, you own it. Well, I mean, I just don't quite understand what that would have meant to walk into Afghanistan, topple the government, and then dust our hands off and walk away. What did we suppose would have happened? Well, there are, of course, well, you, what you say there has deep similarities to what happened in, Afga in Iraq as well. But when you talk about that original period of time, you say that not much was going on in Kabul. I assume a lot was going on in Washington. And according to you, a lot was going on in Pakistan. Uh, so the United States, somebody, CIA, whoever, was sort of deciding during that time, what are we going to do about Afghanistan? And what is very clear from what you say and what, what we can see for ourselves is that the one thing that we're not considering was what was going to happen to the Afghan people. So. Why, when, when I ask you why were we there, you say, well, I can't really say why we were there because I was on the ground, but you make the excellent point that if you're going to be there, you can't just be there and then not do something with the experience that actually aids the life of the people. What you make clear in the section that I read and other, uh, other parts of the article and other interviews that you've done is that the corruption of the Afghan government was an abuse that was almost as bad in the lives of the Afghan people as was the abuse that they suffered at the hands of the Taliban. Please explain that to us. Well, exactly. And what I really appreciate in what you just said, Marianne, is that you're making a distinction between a sort of reductive on-off idea of what a decision is. Do we go or do we stay? You in your question just got below that and you said, if we stay, how do we stay? And that really matters. How do you stay if you choose to stay? How do you go once you've decided to leave? And in both cases, I think we did the how very, very badly. Um, and I started seeing exactly. early on, um, early on in the summer of 2002, I remember getting a group of young people together because we wanted to launch this radio station. And the idea was, you know, what do people want to listen to? This was going to be, you know, certainly the first independent post-Taliban radio station, maybe the first independent radio station ever in Afghanistan. And the, the, the kids were... They kept talking about security, 
But they didn't mean security against the Taliban. They meant security for people against the militias who were roaming around that we, the United States, had armed, that we had dressed in U.S. Army uniforms, that were loyal to a man who had imposed himself as governor, in fact, against President Karzai's wishes at the time, and were, you know, I mean, one kid told me that his cousin was riding his bicycle and the, these militiamen wanted some money from him. No, I think they wanted his bicycle, if I remember correctly, and he wouldn't give it to them, and so they beat him up, and then they took his bicycle. This is the summer of 2002, and these people, and I had you know, half a dozen specific stories like that. And these people were dressed in U.S. Army uniforms. And so what were Afghans to think other than this must have been how we wanted things to go? And I made this case starting, you know, um, then I didn't really have any contacts, but very quickly I was started making this point that what is really going to matter here is how the Afghan government treats its own people. Um, and unfortunately, you mentioned the CIA, and what they had done was kind of connect with the warlords whom the Taliban had kicked out of the country back in 1994. And these were people who were responsible for a kind of chaotic, violent, um, extortionate mayhem during the late uh, I would say during the very early 1990s after the Soviet Union pulled out. So the one thing that Afghans were grateful to the Taliban for was kicking these people out of the country. Everyone I talked to said that. They detested the Taliban, but at least they got rid of the warlord. So what did we do? We allied with those very same warlords and brought them back into the country and put them in position as governors of the major provinces. And we've been hearing many of their names um, in the last several days. And so it was almost as though you had a cancer patient, you know, and you had, um, you know, gotten the patient into remission, and then you take a syringe full of you know, cancer cells, and you, and you inject them back into the body of the patient. There is so much there uh, to ask you about. First of all, did the CIA, did intelligence, so-called intelligence, not know what you were just saying, that the warlords were actually as bad, in some cases, worse to people than the Taliban were, and that we were putting our trust and giving our support to people who were negative, abusive, corrupt influences in the lives of people? Did we not know that? You, you make it clear in things that you've written in other interviews that you've done that during the administration, the Obama administration, you certainly tried to tell them. For sure. And you, you say some very interesting things in interviews. You say that among the, the high-level Obama administration people, you say that you argued What's the point of doing all this military action if the government is so corrupt that people will hate its own government? And how do you expect them to want to stand up against the Taliban? You have said in other interviews that Mike Mullen heard that, but that Mike Mullen, because he was Joint Chiefs of Staff, he was the military, this was really not under his control. This had more to do with state and presidential decision making, which of course means Hillary Clinton. But you also tell a specific story that in around 2010, I think you said, they, were, they, they executed a very well-strategized plan to know who, who is on the take here. Where is the corruption coming from at the highest level? There was a man that they realized had taken a $9, billion, $9 million bribe. They caught him, but he was in the palace. He was close to Karzai. Hamid Karzai didn't like the fact that the United States wanted to get this guy. Through a fit, the United States backed off and never went after high-level corruption again. Is that correct? That's close to correct. So the plan was a very specific targeting of an individual, basically a colleague of mine who was running a very sophisticated task force with Afghans. He had trained them up in how to do quite complex, you know, uh, financial investigations. Th this was an incredible team. Um, and their initial mission, in fact, was to look for 
um, money flows to the Taliban, but they kind of hit a tsunami of corruption money. And so the initial case that they broke was the case of the Kabul Bank, which was the largest private bank in Afghanistan and which we had helped set up, the United States had helped set up, and which was the bank through which the, the United States ran the salaries of all of the Afghan National Army. So this was a bank that had a constant cash flow, right? And it turned out to be a Ponzi scheme. And it was President Karzai's brother, among others, who were getting, who was getting loans. And what he would do is sort of send his gardener or his bodyguard, you know, to the bank to take out a loan for $5 million or $6 million. I don't have the money, the, the amount exact, but the total was 29 million. Now, the case that you mentioned was a sort of spin-off of this because then a decision was made, let's get a corruption case with evidence because Karzai had been constantly saying, you're talking about corruption all the time, but you haven't shown me any evidence. So there was a decision made at high levels of the US government, let's work up a case with evidence. So the target was indeed um, a kind of flunky of President Karzai's, whom I had known actually for a long time as a member of the household. Um, I was not part of this targeting at all, but I just happened to know the person who was um, singled out. And the bribe was not $9 million. I can't remember what the bribe was. It was in some hundreds of thousands of dollars, I think. And it was, and, and some cars and stuff like that. But the effort was to get him to weigh on the Kabul bank case on behalf of the briber. And it was cut and dried and there was telephone taps and you know it was absolute open and shut case with evidence. And so, an arrest was executed, Karzai threw a fit, and as you said, the United States backed off of it. Now, let and me add a, coda. add a coda. Do you know who this gentleman was? The gentleman who was arrested? Hmm. It turns out that he was the bag man who ran the cash between the CIA and President Karzai. So the CIA, I suspect, I don't know this to be the case, but was also not particularly happy about this. Um, and that just shows how self-contradictory our own policy was because the CIA station chief could go and sit and have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with President Karzai and the ambassador would have no idea what was, you know, what transpired in that meeting. And so who knows what advice the CIA gave President Karzai? It's a James Patterson novel. Okay, now let's talk about Karzai. He was our guy. That's mm. why the U.S. backed off. But I think most Americans, I certainly was shocked to read in your articles, and you, you said yourself you were gobsmacked when you first realized Karzai, who was America's chosen guy to run this government, which in fact was corrupt government anyway, had actually been one of the people who brought the Taliban to Afghanistan originally. According to your reporting, the Taliban did not emerge almost spontaneously from Kundahar, the way we have been told, but they were actually a product of Pakistani military intelligence working with Karzai, and that during the 1990s, it was a time when Karzai was actually representing the Taliban or was going to represent them at the United Nations. Certainly the United States knew we were in a war with the Taliban, but the person we had chosen to head things for us in Afghanistan had helped create the Taliban. You'd think, you'd, you'd think. think. And I just, again, I can't answer that. Um, because I don't know what people knew at that time when he was selected. All I can, here, let me tell you something else. And these are very circumstantial and kind of, um, uh, how to put it, intuitive ways of understanding something. 
But as I was learning about these things, and I was very, at that time, I was very close to the household. And in particular, I was close to the servants, the downstairs of the household. And this is Karzai's palace that we're talking about. It, well, <laughs> it was his younger half-brother's household in Kandahar, not the okay. palace in Kabul. Okay. Um, but it's one family, right? You know, right. and so a lot of these people had, you know, been living with Hamid Karzai in Pakistan. And uh, so the CIA had, the, you know, there was this scene where Karzai had come across from Pakistan into Afghanistan. In fact, at, at one point, this is before the fall of the Taliban in uh, 2001. At one point, um, there was fear that his life was in danger. So he was pulled out of Afghanistan, kept in a safe house in Pakistan. This is in 2001, from which he kept on, you know, broadcasting on the radio to Afghans and whatnot. But this is, again, very much under the protection of the Pakistani military intelligence. It was US CIA who had done this. But but the, but the place that he was removed to was inside Pakistan. And then he returned into Afghanistan and he drove. And I asked his household, how did he drive? How was his driving? And they said, oh, you should have seen it. It was incredibly fast, incredibly um, precise. This is rough terrain. This is mountainous, dirt roads, this and that. I have done hostile environments training with, the, with uh, retired special forces, UK special forces, the SAS. And I also did a driving training with um, Land Rover, also in the UK. Uh, combat driving is a, it's a um, technique that you're trained in. When I heard how Karzai drove, that told me something. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, mm -hmm. I don't see how our personnel didn't know what his background was. Um, okay. However, let me just say that when I wrote this in my book, Punishment of Virtue, uh, which came out in 2006, I was frightened. I mean, I thought this information was so explosive that it could possibly bring down the whole mission. And I was stunned to, to, that nobody picked up on it. I mean, one radio interview picked up on it. And I wasn't about to go trumpeting it around the country because I just wasn't sure what the repercussions would be. And I wasn't, you know, I just... I, I didn't want to set off a chain reaction that I couldn't quite foresee what the second and or third order effects would be. Well, it is very obvious that the corporate mainstream media was doing nothing other than parroting whatever the White House was saying. That's all that they, there's the, the lack of congressional oversight. Basically, there was very little of that. They were just asking the, the, the generals, the generals would come in and put a smiley face. There was no media to pick up your story. There was no deep investigation over the last 20 years. And this is part of what's happening is the American people is being seen, shown in such stark terms, the utter bankruptcy of a system, government, media, military, that, uh, that, that has been doing whatever they've been doing in ways that we've had no idea. And I think we are looking to people like yourself right now because we're gonna do the investigation ourselves. So in doing this, in, I'm sorry, you, did you want to yeah, say? Yeah, I'd just like to caveat that just a tiny bit okay. in the following way. Okay. What I, what I meant was, I mean, I published this in a book, therefore, and then I was, you know, interviewed frequently about that book. So my question is, why did nobody even read the book? It was in there yeah. in the book. Yeah, yeah. Th so, that so doesn't there's change that. what I said. Right. right. The but that, there yeah. is something there's something I would like to to just change a little bit, which is the the particularly the newspaper press corps in Kabul was actually very good on these issues. If you go back and look at what Dexter Filkins was writing in The New York Times and then The New Yorker, if you look at Matt Rosenberg, um, those are a couple that I remember. Um, there was a guy for the Washington Post who was quite good. And they, I mean, the reporters on the ground were great. 
after a while, it was hard for them to get their stories in the paper anymore. Exactly. Um, so there's some of that. And then I'd like to say that we are largely, you know, visual, right? We get more and more of our news on the television. Many Americans now get their news by television, right? Um, and these are not stories that are easy to develop with the huge top heavy um, paraphernalia that television reporting certainly required at that time. So I, I do want to say that this information is this kind of understanding really requires um, a type of reporting that's very hard to do these days with stretched um, newsrooms and whatnot. And it involves also getting out of the capital city. And I'd also like to say, similarly, military officers on the ground, I mean, I have a lot of respect for, for the ones that I met. The people I really hold to account here are the senior leaders uh, on the civilian side for, for the failure to address the two major political and diplomatic issues, which were, as you, as you pointed out, uh, Pakistan and corruption, and senior military re leaders for this. What were we doing creating a conventional army in Afghanistan? with people who knew how to fight a guerrilla war <laughs> and were fighting against guerrillas. Why did we turn them into a conventional army that was bound to be completely dependent on expensive materiel and American you know, trainers and maintenance people and things like that? And there we get to the corporate point that you made, okay. which is I, to I say, yeah. I want to take a break just because you bring up so much. So first of all, thank you for mentioning that there were many very fine and very brave, I must say, journalists on the ground uh, in in Afghanistan during that time. So thank you for mentioning that. And thank Alyssa you for Rubin is another one. Alyssa Rubin from the New York Times. And 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 many of them were taking risks to do what they did, and I'm sure were very frustrated at the times that they would send stories back, and wouldn't even have certain things covered. I'm sure they were frustrated at how many of those things, even if they would be covered in something like the New York Times, were then not covered in, let's say, CNN or any of the uh, television stations that would have made their, the information available to the average TV watcher at night. So thank you for mentioning that. I, I, I do think it's worth noting that this is part of a trend uh, in America that has to do with more than just war reporting. Uh, many of the kinds of topics that used to get a reporter a Pulitzer Prize 30 or 40 years ago might get a reporter fired today uh, because the same person who owns the newspaper is the one who owns the factory down the um, street whose uh, who's, uh, uh, pollution you're reporting on. And you and I both know also might be the same company that owns uh, the defense contracting. That goes into the next thing you were talking about. Why were we training them in a conventional war when they were some of the best guerrilla fighters in the history of the world? And then you pointed out that there was so much money to be made doing exactly. it that way because of all the material that would have to be bought. That's where the piggy bank for the defense contractors came in. If they'd really wanted to be uh, helping these, first of all, if they'd want to be helping the Afghan people, they would have not been supporting a corrupt government. And if they really wanted to be preparing an army, they would have been preparing an Afghan army. Not, you know, this the hubris. You said, why were we doing this? We know why we do this. The hubris of the Americans, the arrogance of trying to remake Afghanistan in our image. So we, we made it as corrupt as we are at this point. All right. Have I got that right so far with what I just said? Yeah. Again, I would say we tried to remake Afghanistan in, frankly, the image of what we thought Afghan society was, which is violent warlords, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. We never really made an effort to bring our ideals of democracy and rule of law to Afghanistan. There was never any effort to bring that. And as you beautifully said, what we did was kind of unwittingly or almost um, automatically. Yeah, we 
exported the version of the American government system that we are currently experiencing. Uh, and that is where I see Afghanistan as a very sobering mirror that is being held up to us today. If we don't understand how Afghanistan is a reflection of us, we might be in for scenes like the ones we've been seeing in the Kabul airport. That's my concern. Thank you. I think what you just said is so important for the American people to see. Um, Robert McNamara famously said, um, towards the end of his life. We didn't understand the Vietnamese people. We didn't know their religion. We didn't know their history. We didn't know their culture. And we didn't have anyone to teach us. Well, if he had wanted, I'm sure there would have been someone to teach him. But that seems to me the, to be the same disconnection between the war planners in the Af Afghan war as in Vietnam. You don't know anything about these people and you're not even trying to find out. That's right. And instead of trying to find out, what we did was presume certain stereotypes. So I received recently a comment to my post, the Ides of August, from a retired military person who said, you know, well, here's what I used to tell my soldiers. Um, check your American values at the door. Uh, corruption is just part of Afghan culture. Don't mm. even think mm. about corruption. So what I wrote back to him was, um, could you please tell me where you got that information? Which Afghans informed you that they enjoy being shaken down abusively and contemptuously by their own government officials? That's all I wrote. Lara Jadid in her article, Afghan Meant Nothing, talked about how as a soldier, um, she was fed this idea that the Afghans weren't as smart as us. And she said, I ended up realizing they were smarter, they were stronger, they were oh. braver. Oh. So I want to go back to, uh, to Kamen Karzai and the Pakistani government and the connection to the CIA. You, you talk quite a bit about how the CIA was very close to military intelligence uh, in Pakistan how Pakistan was the creator of the Taliban. And if you look at the map, of course, you have India over here, which is a big rival of Pakistan. Pakistan not nearly as big as India. So of course, having some level of control over Afghanistan would be a big deal for Pakistan in terms of its, its, uh, its uh, um, opposition in some ways to India. One of the questions you ask repeatedly is, given that Pakistan was working clearly against our interests, given that they've given nuclear material to North Korea, to Iran, given that we didn't even tell them where we were going to get Osama bin Laden because we were at least smart enough to know they probably would have tipped him off, the question you ask that I'd I, I think every American needs to ask and that I'd like your further views on is, why do we consider Pakistan an ally? What's going on there? What's, what is this unholy alliance? What is this connection uh, with Pakistan? beats me. I really honestly can't answer that question. I can offer a few thoughts. One is, what do you tell the Gold Star family? Oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. And you know what? The IED that killed your daughter, that you actually paid for that with your tax money. How do we, like, at some point, would you explain uh, that, please? What explain I mean what is said, the Pakistani government was arming and training the resurgent Taliban, and the United States government was providing the Pakistani government with a billion dollars a year in military assistance. So, so we you're were saying, no, hold on. So you're saying it's not just that they trained them and sent them there originally. You're saying that even throughout the war, they were continuing to replenish and to build, right? Because you talk about where did the Taliban get all this, all this, all these arms? I wondered. So it's Pakistan. Meanwhile, we were giving military aid to Pakistan. Correct. Or were we Correct. giving military aid or just financial aid? Military. So it's the most tortured thing you can imagine. The, the, the Pakistani ISI is what reconstituted the Taliban starting in 2003. And I remember the very first kind of attack was in 2003. And the, the perpetrators could not stay inside Afghanistan. 
they had to run straight away back across the border into Pakistan because they would not have been tolerated in Afghanistan. And this was then going on. And we kept saying Pakistan has to, quote, do more to stop the Taliban. And I said, what are you talking about? They're actually constituting them. They are retraining them. They are equipping them. And indeed, they are um, providing them with plans. And to me, that is also evident in the collapse of the post-Taliban government, the government we had been supporting, Ghani's government, um, on the 15th, on the 14th of August, because um, it is clear to me that that was negotiated. Yeah. So where did the money come from to pay off the governors and the army, you know, Afghan National Army generals and whatnot, who agreed to surrender, essentially? Where did the incredibly sink and come from? Where did the focus on the north instead of what would have been more comfortable for ordinary Taliban, which would have been the south and the, and the east, why did they put so much pressure? How did they think to put so much pressure on the north first? All of these okay. things, all of these are questions that, so, that are raised. But I want to ask some questions. things here. Okay. Let's go back a little bit. Yeah. There's no way that the CIA wasn't aware of what was particularly given the close relationship between the CIA and Pakistani military. There's no way the CIA was not aware that the Pakistan throughout the war, even though we were giving them military assistance, they were actually giving the Taliban military assistance. There is no way that the CIA didn't know this. Isn't that correct? That is my personal view. Again, I... Uh, was not privy, and the CIA, you know, wanted to be informed of what I was doing in terms of targeting uh, corrupt officials, not killed, obviously, but for, you know, uh, law enforcement um, um, action. The CIA very much wanted to know what I was involved in, but I never, never was privy to what the CIA was involved in. What I can tell you is that military intelligence people working on the ground became aware of this quite early because they could see it. In particular, because ones, of what? Because of what? Because they could see it. They could see what Pakistan was up to. In particular, um, officers who were stationed up on the borders, the eastern border, because they were being shot at. They and could they see could it. see that it was, was they were from. being, they were not only what country it was coming from, but when it was coming from Pakistani military bases, that they were being shot at from inside the perimeter bases on the border. And so is that is why the military began slowly to come around on Pakistan. I appreciate that you're impeccable in making it clear what you cannot say for sure because you do not know for sure. But you're also very clear, as, as you should be, that some things don't add up and you can certainly surmise. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you also point out is that because Biden was vice president, obviously, during the Obama administration, you say that when there were conversations that you were part of trying to stress and emphasize the importance of the corruption issue, that not only did your boss, Mike Mullen, really hear you and come around on that, but that of all the top Obama officials, you felt that Biden understood that as well. Uh, not from direct interaction with either with him, uh, but there was a story that went back, I think, to 2009, which is, I, I, or, or late 2008, but he traveled um, to Kabul and had dinner with President Karzai and was so um, displeased by what he was hearing that he actually stood up and walked out of that dinner. And he was only person raising the issue of corruption within the Obama administration. Uh, that being said, um, my impression is that he was also somewhat reductive in what he thought 
the answer then was, and it was, we got to get out of there. And uh, again, back to how you began this conversation, it's the how as well as the what. And my sense was that, that he wasn't, his office was not particularly concerned with the how, um, argued strongly against a troop buildup, which I think was a perfectly fair position. I just wish that we had had a governance buildup. I wish that we had thought, we had realized that maybe it's at least as difficult, if not more difficult, to run an Afghan city than it is to command a company or a platoon of Afghan soldiers. Why did we not have um, mentors with civilian officials? And, and so in 2009, in January of 2009, I actually wrote up a sort of comprehensive action plan for Afghanistan. It's about eight pages long. It's also on my site, sarahchase.org. And I, at that time, I was in contact with incoming members of the Obama administration. I provided that plan to um, Richard Holbrook, who was going to be mm -hmm. tapped to be the special envoy, mm -hmm. and to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton herself, because I was invited to her first dinner at the State Department with a number of Afghan and Pakistan folks. And I also provided it to senior military officers. So what I'm trying to say here, I, I'm not saying that my plan was the be all and end all of what we ought to have done, but it was a significantly different approach that was possible to implement and that we did not implement. And so again, if, if, if then Vice President Biden had been concerned about corruption, did he have thoughts about how we might address that? Once we, once his um, boss, President Obama, had decided to stay in Afghanistan and to increase presence of troops on the ground, I didn't see any evidence of Vice President Biden wading in to say, in that case, alongside the troops that we're sending in, we need to do this, that, and the other thing to address the problem of corruption. That I never saw coming out of his office. Well, there are a couple of things there. First of all, we do hear, and who knows what was true in this particular case, but we do hear that there were quite a lot of instances where Biden was pretty much sidelined when vice president and um, that his voice was not what we, what he even himself might have hoped that it would be in terms of deep consideration uh, by Obama and other officials. And also, uh, you have made it clear here and elsewhere that after that one situation with the bribe that was caught and Karzai having a fit about it, you said we backed off. That seemed to be some sort of official position. And apparently, even if Biden had complained, who knows what difference that might have made. But I certainly agree. And he said in one of his speeches recently, he's been to Afghanistan four times. He knows how corrupt it was. And like you said, I'm sure that was a large part of his decision. We got to just get out of there. This is really a rotten deal. But something I had written about was that in any relationship, it is as important as how you leave as how you stay. And as you have also said, it's as important as how the how of anything, how you stay, not just whether or not you stay. Talk to me about the exit. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, did it have to be this disastrous? Uh, many people say, look, losing a war is messy, getting out is messy. And I appreciated that I heard you say there's something very unseemly about just writing it off as messy given how many thousands of people's lives are so horribly affected. In your opinion, could this have been done in a way that would have been um, much better? Or I would assume that you would say it was done the same way we did everything else regarding Afghanistan with very little concern for the people who were living there. That's exactly how I feel about it. I mean, I just think there was, um, you know, again, as I as I suggested, there were, I'm positive, and in fact, I now have pretty good information, reliable information that I feel comfortable with to say that there was a negotiating process that had been going on for months that was not happening in Doha, that was happening, you know, in the provinces um, and with top 
Afghan military um, officers. And I do have to say that a lot of my Afghan friends were pretty surprised that it went this quickly. Um, but, well, as you said, go ahead. I heard you say, and then I had heard you say in another interview that it seemed to you that President Biden basically had a just on off switch about Afghanistan. That was that, just, that yeah. is my feeling. And, and what I would say is that, um, the Doha negotiations that took place, particularly in the uh, President Trump's administration, were absolutely devastating to the Afghan government. Um, concession after concession was wrung out of the Afghan government in order to make it possible for us to say that we were withdrawing with a peace treaty with the Taliban. I mean, it was just a, a, when the Afghan government was not even at the negotiating table. So not one only thing, that, yeah, not only that, but then Biden keeps saying, oh, I just inherited this bad deal. He could have changed that deal. That's exactly where I was going with that, Marianne. Thank you for saying that. In other words, why President Biden say, wow, you know, among the other messes I inherited from my predecessor, and I basically, you know, he reversed the, the departure from the Paris Climate Accord. The so-called peace on had not been ratified. It wasn't a treaty. Reverse that also and say, you know what? This person, uh, my predecessor, negotiated a settlement that was completely unfair to our allies uh, in the Afghan government. If you know, our nominal allies, whatever. And he could have removed the individual who, who negotiated that deal that was so beneficial to the Taliban and so detrimental to the Afghan government. Uh, and that's a gentleman by the name of Zalmay Khalilzad. He was our special envoy to these negotiations, a good friend of President Karzai's who showed up in the middle of the negotiations once again between the Taliban and Afghan officials in these recent months. Khalilzad also lobbied on behalf of the original Taliban government back in the early 1990s to try to um, make it possible for there to be an oil pipeline running through Afghanistan. So once again, I say, who were we using? Who were we, the United States of America, as our envoy? And whose interest was he really promoting here? And, and, and that's what breaks my heart, is you make a decision of this consequence without familiarizing yourself a little bit with the context uh, in which you now find yourself. In other words, I understand that President Biden felt very strongly back in 2009 that it was important to begin removing ourselves from Afghanistan. And I... I I don't think that that was an untenable position in 2009. No, I appreciate but, it. We didn't belong there. Right. But, or we didn't belong there the way we were there, is what I would say. But today is not 2009. So you don't, you know, more than 10 years later, then push the button on the very same decision that you wish you had made more than 10 years ago, because the situation is different. And that's what I find really distressing from an administration that, that, that prides itself on its competence, particularly in international and security affairs. There have been times over the last two or three weeks when I've thought to myself, how are Blinken and Biden any different than Pompeo and Trump on this issue? Pompeo and Trump did that original deal with the Taliban, which as we've discussed here, Biden claims to have just inherited, although he didn't. He could have done what he wanted to do. It was not a treaty. It had not been ratified. But Karzai is now, who we now know, is connected to Pakistan, is connected to CIA. Karzai is going to be working with the Taliban in setting up their new government 
So it sounds to me like we're okay because, uh, according to that crowd, we're okay because we still have our guy in there who will make sure in terms of all the various things you're talking about, like pipelines, uh, will be... Um, uh, will be the agreements that are kept. That basically all that was going on there was can we make a deal with the Taliban that we will continue to get what in fact we want the most out of this. Is that correct? I mean, again, I think it's more than I would probably state it. And what I would say is, first of all, I'm not sure Karzai is going to survive this. I mean, at some point you switch sides enough times and somebody decides, you know, you know what, you're not I very reliable. I thought the same thing myself. Yes. I thought the same thing myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like. You can play that game, you know. Yeah, only so long. That's right. Before you're not uh, useful what anymore. I, what I would say is that it doesn't take a Karzai for, you know, the to Taliban government to want the type of deals that you're talking about because, We've been speaking a lot in sort of the U.S. conversation about what's happened. This is not the Pakistan of two about how this is not the Afghanistan of 2001, that there's a whole new generation of Afghans. We've been hearing that a lot. The same thing goes for the Taliban. This is not the same Taliban as the 1990s. This is a Taliban that has been watching from the sideline as people they know have been getting fabulously rich on the kind of international development manna and not to mention also the drug trade, right? And so um, the Taliban are very interested in tapping into some of that. And that helps explain why we've been hearing these mollifying um, statements and pronouncements from Taliban officials because they're anxious to, those ones are anxious to gain some kind of international credibility and recognition and whatnot so that they can tap into, you know, luxurious meetings in Doha and in Europe and in the United States and development money and whatnot. Um, there is a faction that is much more hardline and the fighters, I think the field commanders who didn't enjoy that type of diplomatic luxury, uh, they, I, uh, from what I am hearing, are not so wild about these um, outward facing pronouncements. And that may explain why we don't see a new president of Afghanistan yet. My understanding is that there's a talk between these different groups and what a friend of mine said is, when money is the object, you're going to get infighting. Um, you're going to get what? Infighting. Infighting yeah. among yeah. different Taliban factions. And let me just say one other thing is I've just heard from somebody, an Afghan American who lives in the United States, who said he's already gotten, he's a lawyer, and he's already gotten contacts from clients who want his help in organizing, you know, major investments in natural resources in the Taliban Afghanistan. So I think the basic picture that you painted is a fair one. Again, I'm, I would just round the edges off a little bit more. I just yeah. want to no, be I as accurate as I possibly can. <laughs> you and can. I are great in and young. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, you, talk, <clears throat> you talk about a quote unquote different Taliban. I'd like to ask you about the women. There mm. is a, the infant mortality rate was cut in half uh, during our stay there. 37% uh, I read of girls now know how to read. What do you think is going to happen in terms of the Taliban and their treatment of women in this upcoming phase? So let me, as usual, add a little bit of nuance to what we're hearing about the condition of women, even on our watch, if you will, or, or under the government that we were supporting. The figure that you cited is probably not, although it's impossible to get numbers in Afghanistan, it's just utterly impossible. But what I, but it is true that a large number of girls were able to go to it is true that women were able to participate in public life, including political life in some cases, in ways that they had certainly not under the Taliban. The, 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 what's the word? 
I don't want to use the word caveat because it's such a um, the the one thing I'd like to say about it is that that's a story that is particularly relevant in the big cities, in particular Kabul and the other large cities in the north and west. That picture was not in Kandahar. It is certainly true that girls went to school in the early years and learned to read. But even as long ago as 2010, 2011, my friends were taking their daughters out of school because it was getting too dangerous. Um, and, uh, you know, the women involved in public life typically were not Pashtuns, which is the dominant ethnic group in the South. And so just what I would like to say is the conditions for women did not universally improve as we kind of believe or we take in from the type of reporting that we're hearing. Um, Thank you. And I would say that the women who worked in my cooperative, now my cooperative was really ordinary people. It was not educated. It was not typical NGO employees or anything like that. This was women on the street. It was widows, not homeless people, but it was ordinary grassroots Afghans. I think I had two or three widows among my eight or, eight or 10 women. Um, they were all beaten by their husbands. Um, they did not work in a burqa. So we had women and men in our cooperative, um, but they certainly came to work in a burqa. And they, we bought a taxi to bring them home at the end of the day. Um, and the reason we bought a taxi is because that was, an, that was a common sight. To see a taxi with half a dozen women in it, that was something that was you know, felt like everyday life. So they felt safe driving home in a taxi. And then we would drop them off, you know, two or three blocks from their homes. So we were taking, having to take extraordinary precautions, even back in, you know, 2010. Um, and so my view is that that is going to be the lot of more and more women now. Um, I think that the women who might be in a position to resist a, quote, return to those conditions will be women, as I say, in Kabul and Mazar-e-Sharif and Herat and cities like that. Um, I do not foresee a mass slaughter of women. I, I, I wouldn't put it past the Taliban to commit some exemplary, gruesome assassinations of women who have been in the public eye but they're not going to go door to door and drag women out of the houses. They can't afford, religiously, they can't do that. So the situation for women is going to be grim. Um, and all I can say is that I hope this generation of women that has in some of these major cities been able to step forward, I hope that they take a deep breath connect with each other and start thinking about what kind of Afghanistan they live in and begin slowly planning for how to bring that Afghanistan into existence with each other and with men that they trust. Because I'm already hearing these Taliban begging civil servants in their positions. I'm already hearing Pakistani officials. I've heard two, sorry, one who is official and one who is by his family closely connected to the Pakistani military intelligence agency and Afghan. In the last two days, I've heard those two publicly calling for, you know, Afghans to stay in their positions in government and for the international community to stay engaged with the Taliban government, because you know what? these Taliban are not capable of governing. And right. so I would almost like to see a general strike on the part of Afghan government workers and let the Taliban try to govern. Uh, or over time, as I say, the plan power took years to implement. And I think that Afghans need to take a breath and think about how to birth 
the Afghanistan they always wanted. You said that we all do. We all need to stand back, take a breath, understand more deeply what happened here. Over the last few days, there's been a lot of hand-wringing on the part of European officials. A lot of, why did we just leave all this up to the Americans? Do you think there's going to be much of a shift here in terms of Europeans recognizing that just allowing the United States to uh, run the operation in certain situations like this will no longer be acceptable? I just don't know. I mean, uh, Europeans in that case would have to put a lot more into their own defense forces. So that's yeah. kind of the question. But I do think, again, back to the U.S. behavior, um, the cavalier attitude toward our allies uh, that has been demonstrated in this withdrawal is shameful. I have found myself having to reach out to the British chief of defense because I know him, because he was commander in Kandahar, and his people have been more effective at taking people out of Kabul than ours have. And, you know, I have been careful to only recommend two individuals whom I know provided, were, were involved in the British efforts in Kandahar and in Helmand province. Um, but that's what I've been reduced to. So here we are, Americans, having to ask our NATO allies to help us when we're the ones who created this situation. So I just, Mary, I feel so ashamed. I feel so ashamed of Afghans and before our European allies. Before the world. Hmm. I'm going to go back to one little thing that I'd forgotten to ask you. Milley has said we had no intelligence to indicate that the Taliban would be able to, to just run over the country the way they did, to be able to reach Kabul as fast as they did. But just to be clear here, given what we know and what was happening the entire time, if they didn't know, they should have known, correct? I think so. I think so. Last question is about ISIS. Oh, I'm sorry, you were going to say something. Well, Marianne, I really wanted to just, again, pull back from the specifics of Afghanistan for a moment and okay. just return to what I was saying about Afghanistan being kind of a mirror of us. So from about 2012, years after I stopped working, after Admiral Mullen retired, I was working at a think tank in Washington. And I was working on international security issues, in particular corruption and the security implications of the type of corruption I had witnessed in Afghanistan. And, you know, in that world, it was fashionable to talk about fragile or failing states, right? And my comment in those conversations was always, you know, these states are deceptive. They may be fragile or failing as states, but they're in fact run by highly sophisticated and successful networks. They're not very successful at governing, but governing is not their objective. Their objective is self-enrichment. And you know what? They're doing a really good job at that. Now let's take a look at our country. Thank you. Talk about failing and fragile. Right. So let's take a look at the mushrooming growths of McMansions that now encircle Washington, D.C. Let's take a look at the portfolios, the offshore bank accounts, the assets, the pay packages of ex top executives in, for example, defense contracting firms, pharmaceutical firms, um, financial investment firms, um, real estate giants, and the lawyers and brokers that service them. Now let's take a look at the policies that many of these executives have either influenced because of their connections with top government officials or have promulgated because many of them have actually rotated in, in and out of government themselves. So those policies include two lost wars, 
a financial meltdown that almost brought down the world economy, um, a global pandemic and an opioid crisis that both have killed hundreds of thousands of Americans. Um, and I'm sure we could come up with a few others. What and I want to know all is, of that. What I want to know is, first of all, have any of those individuals been held accountable for the abject failure of their policies? And secondly, does this not resemble the developing world fragile and failing states that I'm talking about? There is a network uh, of top business executives and government officials who often trade places um, that really has been in charge in the United States for the last number of decades. And they have promulgated a lot of spectacularly unsuccessful policies. I mean, embarrassingly um, disastrous policies. While they have been extraordinarily successful in enriching themselves, this is the mirror that we need to look in. And we have to stop looking in it while we're wearing our team jerseys with eyes only for the evils of the person wearing the other color jersey and never really holding our own team to account. This is what I really wish Americans would start to do. It's not my job to call the other side, the other gender, the other race to account. It's my own community, whether that be my political community or my gender community, that's who I need to hold up to its own highest standards. And that's what I wish more Americans were doing right now. Well, I think more Americans are seeing exactly what you're saying. And of course, this refers to your book on corruption in America. And you're making such an excellent point that the Afghan war is just an example of the way America operates these days, where money to be made for a small group of people takes precedence over the health and safety and the welfare and the security of the American people, other people in the world, and the planet on which we live. I think more and more people are waking up to this. Uh, the week before, uh, the, this debacle in, Afga in Afghanistan exploded the way it did. We had the UN climate report. So exactly. more and more people are seeing that over the last 40 years, the political establishment, the economic, military, and political establishment in the United States, which of course includes that matrix of lobbyists and media moguls, et cetera, has not just ill-served us, it has harmed us. And as Af Afghanistan shows, it has harmed so many people in the world. For so sure. If you and I thank you for bringing up the environment because that was the main group that I left out. It's the fossil fuel industry, um, which has successfully deceived the American public for years um, mm -hmm. and is devastating our beauteous earth. And it's not just about parts per million of CO2. We're talking about our rivers. We're talking about um, sensitive habitats like um, like uh, wetlands, like tropical forests, like coral reefs. Um, we, each of us, need to become the champions of those living beings who don't have, you know, language to be able to defend themselves. Um, and that includes the animals. Exactly. The wild yeah. animals. That's right. Yeah. Animal factory farming so much that people are, are realizing now. And we need people like you, Sarah, who explain to us what the specifics are. The, the American people are not stupid, but people aren't connecting the dots because the very institutions that should be educating us, the very institutions that should be helping us to put all the dots together are in too many ways, in too many cases, purposely confusing the dots, jumbling them up, obviously, for their own purposes. I just have one more question for you about Afghanistan, and then I will let you go. You've been so generous. What about ISIS and ISIS-K? We keep hearing about ISIS-K. How is ISIS-K different than ISIS? What do you see looking forward? We're told that this uh, latest horrific explosion at the airport was from ISIS. Do you have any thoughts you want to share about that and what you think is going to happen in the struggle between the Taliban and ISIS in Afghanistan? You know, I really don't 
Marianne, and it's um, partly because I don't know. I just don't have insight into who these ISIS folks are, what the nature of their communications or relationship with the Taliban might be, but also because I frankly think we have overblown the danger of terrorism from the beginning. I'm not saying that that bombing was not horrific. I'm not saying that 9-11 was not horrific, but I just think that in comparison with the damage that has been caused by some of, by, as you said, by these money maximizers, compared to the damage done to our health, to the health of the planet and to our lives. Um, you know, as many people committed suicide in the wake of the crash of 2008, as were killed in the terrorist attacks of 9-11. So I actually think that terrorism has been a distraction from the real issues that we need to be focusing on as a nation and as people. Thank you, Sarah Chayas. Thank you for saying it. Thank you for putting it out there. Thank you for the impeccability of your, of your reporting, um, for your courage, for your clarity. And um, I hope that we will have uh, more opportunities in the future to talk both publicly and privately about things that um, you know and that all of us need to hear. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you for having me and for the depth and thoughtfulness of your questions. Thank you.